our children and youth as they head to class. Lord, would you meet with our children and youth this morning? Lord, would you speak to their hearts? Even as you've been speaking in service today, Lord, let there be an awareness in each and every one of their spirits of you touching them and speaking to them. In Jesus' name, amen. As they're headed out, I want to remind you, next week is a summer Sunday. We have had, I believe, 18 summer Sundays, and only one of them had rain. Those are good odds. So we just want to encourage you, bring uh, lawn chairs if you want. We will be meeting in back of the church outside, barring problem weather. So, All right, we are continuing in the book of James. Last couple of weeks, we talked about putting away filthiness and rampant wickedness. Last week, we spoke of being doers of the word and not just hearers, but we want to actually respond in obedience. So I have a question to start things off this morning. Should we be religious or not? Now, probably some of the people you work with or your neighbors, if they look at you, they, they would say, oh, that's a religious person. True? Is that true? So my question is, should we be religious or not? We are getting great responses in both directions. Some of you are like, some of you are like, Well, I think it is a matter of definition, isn't it? It's a matter of definition. And James start to, starts to address this issue of defining what religion should be. Now, we have preconceived ideas of what religion should be. Some of it has to do with hand signals. Or you're, if you're higher on the food chain, it's... Am I right? And those, those are signs of religiosity. I don't know that that's a word, but we'll use it today. Uh, I just hope Linda won't bleep it out later on the video. But those are signs we look at and say, oh, that's a religious person, a religious person. But the problem is, Scripture actually doesn't portray being religious in a negative way all the time. But it does portray it in a negative way some of the time when the wrong things are used. But James gives definition to what is supposed to happen in these final verses of chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. James says this, If anyone thinks he is religious, do you think you're religious? It's actually okay to think you're religious, potentially and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And it's amazing that he puts all these things together. A lot of the church will very much focus on those first two things, visiting orphans and widows. They'll quote it, and they stop there. And that's the end. The problem is, the last half of the verse is just as important as the first half of the verse. And he says, and keeping oneself unstained from the world. He's saying this is what comprises Religion that is worthwhile, or, or pure and true religion. First, we want to just look at this thought. Religion and knowing Jesus can be two very different things. And we've got to be careful of that. I've heard people say, you've heard it before, he got religion. It sounds like something that's in a Western, doesn't it? He got religion. Or, she's a religious person. I'm not exactly sure what that means, other than those outward hand symbols that we kind of all picture it to be. Attending church, believing God exists, is religious. But is that 
true religion. Because those things aren't even mentioned in these verses, interestingly enough. Religion in this sense, in this verse, actually, is easily defined as a ceremonial observance. In one way or another, we observe a ceremony. Yesterday there was a wedding here. I think all of you were here, or most all of you were here yesterday. Okay, was that a religious observance that we did? It actually was. It was very, very much a religious observance. Uh, not, we started it off by inviting the Lord to show up, to come and be with us, and I believe that he did. We read scripture throughout, and we exhorted the couple and all of us as part of that process on what clear definitions of marriage were and what the boundaries were of those and how it's to be carried out in a lifetime. Clear religious observance. Is religion bad? No. There's no claim in these verses to it being bad. And so I think we have to be very careful because when people even use that term negative about us, we got to be careful in how we respond back because it's easy to respond, I'm not religious. Well, we want to be careful. It's often misunderstood and often confused even by all of us. First and foremost, we must know that Jesus is the only option. And I think the real problem with this concept of religion is getting... Jesus and religion mixed up. We've got to have a relationship with him in order for our religion to be right. Our religion in itself is not going to lead us to Jesus. He will lead us to true religion. And we've got to have that proper relationship in hand. All right? Understanding that. John 14, 6 and 7 said, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know Him and have seen Him. And Jesus was expressing that He is that door. In other words, religion is not the door. All right? This is a little bit heretical, but Starville's not the door, all right? Because your neighbors are going to equate religion and Starville because you come here. But Starville's not the door, is it? Jesus is that door. He's the door that leads us to a relationship with the Father. Nothing else is going to work, all right? However, if He's working in us, other things in our life are going to change and we're going to observe Him in a special way. We're going to have ceremonial observances even of Him. Now, I want to put a warning in this as well, in this first point. There are those who carry a religious spirit about them. In 2 Tim Timothy 3, verse 1, it says, but understand this, in the last days there will come times of difficulty, and in verse 5, jumping down, it says, it's talking about people in the last days, they have an appearance of godliness. They're religious, but they deny its power. And Paul, in these verses, says, avoid these people. He's saying, there are people who are religious, but they deny the power of Christ, of Him making a changing path in our life they deny all that even though they're religious and Paul it so strongly is strongly opinionated about this he says strongly avoid those people how do you avoid them you've got to go around them don't you they you can't let them get in your way and trip you up so we've got to be very careful about this religious attitude this spirit of religion in Acts chapter 16 verses 16 through 18 we have this story uh, of someone who experienced someone with a religious spirit and it says this as they were going to a place of prayer we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling she followed Paul and us crying out 
And this is interesting to me. She says, these men are servants of the Most High God. Was that true? She said, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Is that true? Those were true statements that she said. And yet Paul saw something beyond that. He said there's a spirit behind this. Even though what she said was true, and if you took the words, it was like, oh, that's okay. That's okay. We say it about other churches and religions. Oh, what they say, that's okay. We're the same. We believe the same. And yet, there can be something underlying that is problematic. I have a personal example of this. Many years ago, we were traveling uh, with our daughters, and we had the opportunity to be in Jerusalem. And while in Jerusalem, we saw what are called the holy sites. Some of them aren't very holy, but they're sites. And we went into uh, the what is now a very stone, uh, open-air kind of church where uh, Jesus was supposedly crucified in that area and then where he was buried. And we went into this small area that you could only fit two or three people at a time in, in the place where supposedly he was buried. Is it really where he was buried or not? I don't know. But that's what they advertised. As we're standing in line with our daughters, there was a lady behind us that was obviously religious. How could I tell? She was adorned in a religious way. She was dressed up looking religious. She wasn't wearing a religious uh, habit or order from being part of something, but it was obvious she was very religious herself. She was carrying some religious things with her. And we're just standing in line waiting to go up to this, I'll call it tourist site, because that's all, all I know to call it. I don't know exactly what it is. But it's considered a holy place. And she begins to talk. And what she started to say was similar to what Paul experienced. She said some good things to begin with, some true things. But I started to feel really creepy. Like bugs were crawling all over me. And her conversation eventually started to turn. And she began telling us that this is the most holy site in, in the world. And when you're in this place, you can ask for anything and you'll receive it. And it all started to turn and I felt... I felt the cockroaches come out all over. Do you know what I mean? It was just like, yeah. <laughs> and it was very obvious there was a religious spirit either in that place or attached to that lady. The words were mostly right. I could mostly agree with it. And yet, there was something very wrong with it. Paul experienced that with this woman here as well. Everything seemed good, but something wasn't right. There was a religious spirit behind it. And we want to be very careful because we can be attached to or allow religious spirits to attach themselves to us if we're not careful. And they can come in and take over. I think we've all known people that have had relationships with the Lord and when you're with them, you're edified and encouraged. We've also been with other people who can quote the same verses, but when you're with them, you feel dirty and upset. And that religious spirit is there. We want to be very careful. And James is warning us that there is an outward religious attitude and an inward religious spirit that can take over if we're not careful and it will affect things and take us in the wrong direction so there's a strong warning a very strong warning we must be careful how did paul deal with this he says i 
he said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. We want to have a lot of the Holy Spirit in us so we can discern this issue. Now we're going to come back to this at the end of service today because I feel the Lord moving on this area specifically of a religious spirit. We want to be very careful. James goes on, however, and says this. Verse 26, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religious religion is worthless. One proof that we have true religion or the proper religion is that we can bridle our tongue. That our tongue is under control of the Holy Spirit. In Proverbs 18.21, it says life and death are in the tongue. You can say things that produce life. Is that true? Everything you see, you smell, you hear, you touch, you taste, was created with words. Pretty powerful, right? Our Heavenly Father created all things into being. He spoke them into being. So words are creative. Our words are also creative. They can produce life or they can produce death. We've got to be very careful that our words produce life. The problem is some Christians involve themselves in witchcraft. You say witchcraft? Yes, by using words that actually bring a curse. We want to be those that use words, however, to bring life. Words that bring life. In Ecclesiastes 10 verse 20 it says, Even in your thoughts don't curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich. Have you ever done that at home? Curse the rich? Come on. You have. I can tell. For a bird of the air will carry, carry your voice. Some winged, winged creature will tell the matter. In other words, we've got to be very careful because our words produce life and they produce death. Once again, that's tied to those verses that we looked at three or four weeks ago about being quick to listen and slow to speak. So much of our problem is we just say too much. And if we would just stop early in the process, it would be so much better for us. If you, your mom told you this at one time or another or one of those aunts that you had told you, if you don't have something positive to say, see, we had the same aunt. Most wars are started only with words, aren't they? Our words are powerful. James is saying religion without the controlling of what comes out isn't religion at all in the truest sense. If our tongue is not under control, then we're really just acting it out. We're really just acting it out because eventually what is in your heart will be on your tongue. He goes on to say this, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. And there is a purity that the Lord wants to bring in our religion. And religion, once again, is the practice of the definite practice of a, a religious ceremony. All right? And we, we do it in many different ways. If you've been in a restaurant lately and just bowed your head in prayer for your food, that's a religious ceremony that is happening because you're communicating with the Heavenly Father, aren't you? And He's saying, What is pure? and undefiled before God. If we have the right fruit, it's going to be obvious. If Jesus is really a part of the situation, the religion will become pure. 
Why? Because He's in us and He's directing us. And it's not according to our terms. Right? Is religion according to your terms? About 30 years ago, I was at a wedding. And the wedding was on a Saturday night. And a relative came up to me and said, Oh, I don't have to go to church tomorrow. And they said, I went today. And I just nearly burst out laughing. There was a religious ceremony, right? But was it for the ceremony's sake? Or was it to know Jesus? Was it to know Him? The ceremony, if it's not part of knowing Him, it's no good. It's got to affect our tongue. It's got to affect our life. But it's no good. All right? It doesn't matter. We were in a church a lot of years ago, and we walked in, and it was beautiful. But it was really smoky in the place. And why it was so smoky is they had this wall you walked up to, and you could buy candles to burn. And a lot of the people came in, and they bought the one euro candles, which were about this big. And you could light them, and it made a light there. But then there were some people who came in with bigger candles. And this is no joke. At the far end of the, sales, the candle sales table, <laughs> they had some seven-foot-high candles that were this big around that you could buy the seven-foot candle. Now, I thought, well, you know, based on the amount of wax in the thing, that's a better value because I shop at Costco. <laughs> But does that bigger candle produce more relationship with Jesus? It just doesn't, does it? We've got to be careful. Now, we laugh at those things, but we do similar things. We do, and we've got to be careful. Pure religion. Pure religion. True religion. Not according to our terms, according to His terms. Our way of doing things is as filthy rags. His way is righteous. Psalm 119.1 says in an older translation, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. In the ESV it puts it this way, Blessed are those whose way is blameless. Our way being blameless has to be at the core of what James is talking about here. That's what's pure and undefiled. Where there's not another motive. Not just, man, if I get this seven foot candle, they're going to see my flame for the next four weeks. We must be careful. Pure and undefiled means there's no mixture or no wrong underlying motive in in that religious observance that we're making. Now, when Jesus called Nathanael in John chapter 1, verses 47 to 49, he said about this guy, he said, Behold an Israelite, Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Whom there is no deceit. In that concept, concept of true religion is one there is where there is no deceit. Because so much of religious observance is about deceiving others. It's about showing others that you're just a little bit more holy than they are. But when that deceit is there, it doesn't produce righteousness, does it? We've got to be very careful. We want to be like Nathaniel in that perspective because we, we tend to do things so that others will notice. We've got to be careful. There was no deceit in him. When I picture deceit, I picture uh, old movies that we've seen where someone goes out and performs a murder and they go to confessional that night to get it resolved so the next day they can go murder again. We've got to be careful because these things 
We wrap these things in our head in a wrong way. Pure religion is the fact of what you see is what you are. Where there's not that deception. In verse 27, James narrows it down a little more. He says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God. So he's saying, this is the right religion. And we want to have this type of religion. Is this. To visit orphans and widows. But there's a phrase right after it. In their affliction. In their affliction. I can remember when I was young, and I, my dad might remember the story. I used to go visiting with him. And there was a certain family that we would visit that I always kind of loathed to go visit them. They were older. They were very old from my perspective at that time. But they were old and they were housebound. And their house smelled. And it didn't smell of lavender. It just smelled. And a little six-year-old boy going into that house... It was very hard on me. <laughs> but the fact was, it was their time of affliction. They were at a place in life where they just couldn't keep up with the way that they could at that time. They could at younger times in their life. It was difficult. Life was not easy for them. I don't think any of you here know who I'm talking about. Except my parents, maybe. But it was difficult for them. We can attach ourselves to widows and orphans when everything's good, right? If they host a block party, you want to be there, don't you? They're going to serve crumpets and tea and celebrate the queen being there for so many years, and that'll be exciting. But when they're going through their affliction, are we there? And Jesus is saying true affliction is being with orphans and widows when it's bad, when it's hard, when it's not good. Are we there at that point? Where are we when people are suffering? It's difficult to stay with those who are suffering. Older theologian said this, the only true religion in the sight of God is this, to visit with counsel, comfort, and relief. I like the way he put that. Counsel, comfort, and relief. The fatherless and widows. Those who need it the most. In their affliction, in their most helpless and hopeless state. That we're willing to be with them at that time. Now this is not a new idea that Jesus brought. In fact, he could have been quoting this from Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, where it says this. He says, wash yourselves. There, again, that idea of being clean. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil from your deed. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's case. The fact is, it's been this way the whole time. Since the Lord created us, it's been this way. So I want to ask a simple question, because I heard this talked about uh, recently uh, by someone. Someone said, and I'm paraphrasing what they said, why is it helpless people are attracted to me? And there's been a few times I have felt that way. Do you know what I mean? Why is it helpless people are attracted to me? That's actually, according to these verses in James, a very enviable position. Because he's not talking about orphans and widows who, 20 years before, their dad owned an oil company and they kept all the shares. He's talking about those who have nothing. Attach yourself to them. Let them attach themselves to you. 
And when I heard that person, it was a series of text messages and stuff, say, why are these people attracted to me? I realized that's the blessing. That's the blessing that we're called to. That's the blessing that he's calling us to. God blesses those who help the helpless. It's easy to help those who you expect to pay you back or to pay you back even better than the help you gave. But that doesn't count. The end of that verse, he also says, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Everyone mentions the orphan and the widow. That's where many people stop. But being unstained from the world, not polluted with what is going on. The world is a polluted place right now. There's no way to get around it. It's polluted. It takes effort to not become polluted. Have you ever had the attitude, I can't help but being polluted? I got to be around these other things. We want to be careful with that because Galatians chapter 1 verses 3 and 5 says this, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. Do you believe that? Yes. But then there's this next phrase, to deliver us. What does it mean to deliver us? That means he protects us from something bad about to happen. And then it says this phrase, from the present evil age. He's able to deliver us from the present evil age. That means we don't have to be polluted. The being polluted is actually a choice that we make to walk in a direction that allows ourselves to be polluted. Now, you can be around dirt and be wearing the right outfit and not be polluted. Right? We got on a plane uh, at the end of COVID last year. Maybe it was still in COVID. And somebody got on the plane in a white suit with a head helmet with a vacuum that blew air into their helmet that was purified. I thought maybe they were on the moon flight but they weren't. They were on my flight. And as it was like an eight or ten hour flight, as we got further into the flight, eventually the helmet came off. <laughs> and eventually the gloves came off and they participated in the germs of the rest of us. But we can keep ourselves from the pollution of the world. But that's a choice we have to make. That's a religious choice to not be polluted. It doesn't involve saying, I shall not do that. It involves not doing it. The real action of not doing it. There is grace in the current age. Let's stand together this morning. Now I'd like us to return to that thought early on. So what is your religion? Are you a Christian? Are you a born again Christian? Are you an evangelical? Are you a Pentecostal? Are we part of Zion Fellowship? Are you part of Starville? All these are nice things. They're good things. They're our identity, right? But that's not our religion. That's not our religion. If any of those things are our religion, we're missing the point. And that becomes an outward 12-inch, 7-foot high candle that we're simply burning to be looked at, to be respected by others. But I'd like to narrow around, once again, that religious spirit issue. I know someone uh, from my past, she uh, it was in a whole other continent. She was part of the church there, and what she said was good. 
what she said, the, the words that she used were good. But she had a religious spirit about her that was so negative and destructive that no one in the church wanted to spend any time with her. And this religious spirit controlled what she did, and she made it in a very outward way, but it was very destructive to everyone around her. And I was reminded of her this morning with all of us. Are we allowing a religious spirit to control things? There's some people you can be with that they'll quote a verse to you every other sentence. And yet, you feel the cockroaches crawling, don't you? Is that a problem for us? I believe there's some of that in all of us that the Lord wants to deal with. That we want to lay down to Him today and say, I don't want the outward action, Lord. I want the, yeah, control. I want my lips controlled. That's one I need. I want my lips controlled. I want to be willing to help the helpless in their worst time of need when it's really bad for them. And I don't want to be undefiled. That needs to be my religion. But these other things get mixed in. And I want to pray this morning that the Lord break that. That He break a religious spirit that is in Starville. That is in some of us. That outward, we want everything to look well, but there's... I worked with a guy, he used their, this phrase, he said, but there's maggots there. There's maggots there. And the Lord wants to break that religious spirit so that a purity will come forth. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. And Lord, we want to do that which pleases you. Lord, as James exhorted us this morning, Lord, there is a religion that's pure, that's holy. One proof of it is that our tongue will be in control. If our tongue's not in control, well, we've got an issue. Lord, another proof is that we're allowing the helpless to attach themselves to us. We care. We reach out. We supply. Lord, another proof is that we're undefiled by this world. Lord, we want our true religion to be that. But Lord, I come to you about this area of a religious spirit that can come in. And Lord, I'm asking that you would deal with that this morning. Lord, that we wouldn't give a religious response as a show, but that that would be dealt with in our hearts. Lord, I know some here this morning you're speaking to. Lord, would you deal with that issue? Cut it off, we pray. That we would be true, true, true to you. In Jesus' name, amen.